Hi everyone. My name is um, Alice Rowan Zhang. I'm a fourth year PhD student at the Department of Communication at Northwestern. Uh, my research is being focused on health communication and mobile interventions for mental health um, with a focus on um, interface design and user experience. So today I'm very honored to be able to share about my thoughts and experience of open science um, as a graduate student. And um, I'm very ex excited about this opportunity to uh, talk with you. Yeah, and I'm Jacob Fisher. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Communication at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I'm a researcher in the Media Neuroscience Lab and soon to be assistant professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And I'm also really excited to talk about open science as an early career researcher and some of the benefits and challenges. Uh, so for today, um, uh, Jacob and I, we are going to chat about some of the benefits of open science as early career researchers. And then we'll move on to talk about some of the challenges facing early career researchers who tend to implement um, open science practices. Um, and I'll start first by talking about the open science education in graduate school and the benefits of conducting replication studies in improving students' learning. Um, so one of the suggestions in our agenda we proposed is to conduct replications, which helps us to understand um, if important scholarship still holds up in other contexts. So replication work can be especially attractive and beneficial for graduate students um, when they are still learning some of the basics of research. Um, so Professor Nick Bowman has also mentioned this in his introduction video, and I want to echo this point and speak a bit more about it. Um, so in many graduate school, uh, they have classes about research methods and um, both quantitative and qualitative, uh, which help students lay the foundation of their research project in the future. And I personally benefit a lot from this methods class, and oftentimes these classes would require students to do a mini project to practice what they learn from the class. Um, but the problem is, it's often very hard to craft and complete a whole project within a semester or just a quarter, which is a very short amount of time. Um, so this puts a lot of stress on students and also the teachers. And here's where open science and replication studies can help. Um, and we all know that the best way to learn is to learn by doing and sometimes by imitation, um, especially in the early stage of a career. Uh, like when we are trying to learn a new language or to play a new instrument, um, being able to observe how others speak uh, or play is the most effective way to learn. So similarly, when we are replicating a research project or a study, the research design and conceptual conceptualization are already established. And so like in quantitative work, the analytic procedure and script may be also publicly available. So it's great, it's a great opportunity for students to practice doing the work and to connect the theories they learn in class to hands-on experiences. Um, and being able to do some replication work and stand on the shoulders of the giant when students just embarked on their academic journey would be definitely beneficial. Um, it can also contribute to an effective learning and teaching experience. So on the other hand, for students who are brand new to research, they may not know what counts as a good study. So in this case, teachers need to take the responsibility of picking solid research that they think are worth replicating. Um, so even though there has been a lot of criticism towards incremental work and replications, I think it does have some value for grad students and those who don't have the opportunity and resources to con conduct more practical work uh, like minority, minority groups or low income populations. So it's time to reconsider the importance of replications and, and open science in graduate school. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a really good point. And I especially like the idea of using replications as something like a mini project in a class or in training for graduate students. And one of the things I think is really beneficial about open science as an early career researcher is that you get to not only share your research with the world in a new way and in a more full way, but you also get to have the unexpected or maybe expected side effect of sharing your research with yourself and with other people that you collaborate with in a way that's a lot more effective. So 
in the lab, in the media neuroscience lab, we've adopted open science practices for a while now. And one of the things that we've noticed that helps us quite a bit is in training new researchers that join our lab and even our undergraduate research assistants. So whenever people are interested in a study, we're able to point them to a well-documented repository that contains study information along with variables and even analytic code. And that lets us collaborate in a way that's a lot more efficient and not have to reinvent the wheel every time we train new scientists and new researchers. And it also helps yourself. So for example, one of the quotes that I love in the open science space is that your number one collaborator is yourself six months ago and they don't answer emails. And so having a well-documented code and well-documented data is extremely helpful for yourself as well to help yourself go back to a project that maybe you've left off on to do other things or to just try to get a paper more well organized and sent out for publication. So open science practices are really beneficial for early career researchers in many ways, but there are also a lot of challenges to how early career researchers are expected to navigate within an environment in which open science practices are becoming more of the norm, especially when it comes to things like shifting standards. So in open science, we have um, this idea that we should have a standard of how open our data should be and how we share those data. But a lot of times this standard is not what's been applied within the literature and within the incentive structures that we use to evaluate academics, either for things like graduate school admission or even getting further along and job application processes and tenure evaluations is a lot of times the only baseline for how research is evaluated is as far as number of publications, and maybe the impact factor of journals. Whereas these more overall processes that benefit the scientific community as a whole with engaging in open research are comparatively less incentivized and less rewarded. So as we move forward as early career researchers, I think a primary challenge for us is gonna be in understanding how to gradually refine incentive structures to start to incentivize things like individuals who are sharing code in a publication or sharing data versus just the publication itself. And then also even just more meta processes like building software packages and creating other tools that benefit the scientific community as a whole. So I think this is gonna be a challenge that we have as early career researchers and a challenge that as early career researchers, we can kind of pass on to more senior scholars and those who are right now in these positions of making these decisions is how do we change the structures of how we're evaluating people like ourselves and other people who are applying for jobs and promotions and how to incentivize open research practices and that benefit the scientific community as a whole. Yeah, definitely. I think totally agree that um, shifting the incentive structure is a, always is often the first step to uh, shifting a culture and creating a culture of open science. Um, so I think it's a great way to think about how um, not only in academia in general, but also in graduate school, how to educate graduate students to have the idea of open science, right? So this might require uh, the professors and teachers in graduate school to incorporate open science as part of the um, ethics uh, research, like uh, in uh, like ethics classes or ethics um, uh, lectures to, because here at Northwestern we have the class and um, it's part of the, it's the requirement class for us to study about the ethics of research. So it's just the core class, but no one talks about open science. So I think if we want to um, create the culture of open science, it's really important for all graduate schools to incorporate open science as part of their um, teaching, like for um, their course uh, structure. So that would help the graduate student early early career researchers to have this idea in mind when they are doing research. Yeah, absolutely. I think training in open science practices is critical as far as even younger researchers and people who are hoping to engage in more open science practices. Maybe that's something we can talk about a little bit more in our larger discussion with the rest of the panelists is kind of what are some practical steps we can take to increase transparency and openness in research and refine the incentive structures in a way that's, that's not totally changing everything all at once. So kind of what are the practical small steps that we can take? And I'm excited about our conversation with the other panelists. And if you have any questions for us, you can reach out or ask questions in the platform that ICA is using. And we look forward to chatting more and learning more about open science from the rest of our panelists. Thanks. Thank you.